Cure PSP's mission is to provide education and support for people and their families affected by PSP, CBD, MSA, and related brain diseases while funding research towards a cure and prevention. Webinars are made possible by the generosity of donors and other supporters. My name is Bruce Ginelli and I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at Cure PSP. The topic of our webinar today is multiple system atrophy, problems and solutions. Questions for our speaker will be accepted at the end of the presentation. At that time, a chat box will appear at the bottom of your screen where you will be able to type and submit any questions you may have. We will field as many questions as time allows. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lawrence Golby. Dr. Golby is the Director of Research and Clinical Affairs for Cure PSP and a Professor of Neurology at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He graduated from Brown University and NYU School of Medicine and did residency training at NYU Bellevue before joining the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School faculty in 1983. He was acting chair of his department from 2000 to 2003 and has been program director of the neurology residency since then. His subspecialty is Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders and he has been named by U.S. News and World Report as one of five New Jersey neurologists in the top 1% of that specialty nationally. His research is in the clinical genetics and epidemiology of Parkinson's and related disorders where he has more than 174 full-length peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Golby led the clinical portion of the project that in 1997 identified the first known gene for Parkinson's disease. His work in PSP has centered on its genetics and epidemiology and he has devised the PSP rating scale which has become the most widely used clinical measure for PSP worldwide. His volunteer work aside from that for Cure PSP includes serving as the president of the Dwight Morrow High School Alumni Educational Alliance which funds academic improvements at his high school in Inglewood, New Jersey. Dr. Golby? Okay, thank you, Bruce. Just had to unmute my microphone there. I see we have a excellent audience here, nice long list of people. Um, what I will do is um, I'll skip some of the more technical slides. They'll be available for you afterwards on the uh, Cure PSP website. And that way we'll leave a little more time for Q&A after, uh, after my formal lecture. It's amazing how people come up with questions that I didn't in a million years anticipate. And uh, that's one of the things that makes this kind of thing fun and uh, rewarding. I feel like I'm really uh, answering people's questions. So let us proceed with the, the first issue is every disease needs a celebrity to raise its profile, get the donations flowing. This is MSA's celebrity, Johnny Cash. He had the, uh, the Shy Drager variant of MSA. I'll talk about what that means. Uh, MSA is a complicated disease. Uh, it's, uh, it, you can think of it as a triangle. There are three main components and a lot of smaller components that I'll discuss later. And the three main components are very variable from one person to the next. You can have mostly a Parkinsonian picture where it looks a lot like Parkinson's disease. Uh, that variant of MSA is called striatonigral degeneration. And you can have a variant that's mostly autonomic problems. I'll talk about what that means. And that's, that used to be called the Scheidrager syndrome. These terms, the Scheidrager and the striatonigral are now outmoded terms now that it's been discovered that they're all just MSA. And then there's a variant which is mostly cerebellar. And what we mean by that is that the person kind of looks and talks like they're drunk. The problem with the cerebellum, which is the main balancing and coordinating organ in the brain. And people who have uh, predominantly that form used to be called sporadic 
OPCA, Olivo Ponto Cerebellar Ataxian. Now, any one person with, P with uh, MSA will be somewhere in this triangle. They may be uh, over here where the green arrow is, for example, and that, that person would have very little cerebellar, and they would have pretty much half Parkinsonian and half autonomic. Somebody who's over here would have very little autonomic, and they'd be mostly Parkinsonian and cerebellar. Uh, and uh, there are people all over this triangle. And there are some that are extremely in one little corner, and they can be real diagnostic dilemmas. The, uh, the multiple in multiple system atrophy means that lots of different areas of the brain are affected, unfortunately. And this is a diagram of many of those areas. This is called the basal ganglia. Ganglia means a collection of brain cells in one place, all connected together electrically. And these are the areas that control movement. There are various other diseases that affect this, of course. And if they just affect one little area of the basal ganglia, you can have involuntary movements of various sorts and tremors and balance problems and eye movement problems and slurring of speech, all sorts of movement-related things. The uh, part that makes the Parkinsonism in MSA is the same part that makes Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. That's here in what's called the midbrain. It's the top of the brain stem the very top of the connection between the large part of the brain and the, uh, this is the cerebrum, large part of the brain, between that and the spinal cord is the brain stem, and the top part of the brain stem is the midbrain, and in the midbrain are these two bands of dark substance. Dark substance in Latin is substantia nigra, and those, the, the pigment that makes the the dark substance dark fades away because the cells that it's in are fading away. And this is what happens in Parkinson's disease. And in MSA, it looks very similar, a loss of the pigment in the substantia nigra. And this is responsible, as I say, for the Parkinsonian parts of MSA, the slowness and the stiffness. But not everybody with MSA, of course, has that. They may be in a part of that triangle where there's not much Parkinsonism. Now you'll notice that a very important part of the brain is not any particular color here. The cerebral cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain, that is pretty much spared in MSA. Not completely, but pretty much, which is why there's very little dementia in MSA. Whereas with Parkinson's, a majority of people develop dementia eventually, with PSP, it's worse than that. And um, something like Huntington's disease, which is another basal ganglia disease, affects this part here mainly, the putamen and the caudate. Uh, that involves a lot of cortical problems, which is why in Huntington's there's a lot of dementia. Not so in MSA, fortunately. Now, another important part of the brain involved in MSA is this part here. Here it is in a normal, healthy person. This is the cerebellum. This part back here. This is a nice, healthy-looking cerebellum. This is the brain stem. This is the middle part of the brain stem, called the pons. Here are the person's eyeballs and the lenses in their eyes. Here's somebody with the uh, cerebellar form of MSA, that uh, OPCA, olivopontocerebellar ataxia. Here you can see that the cerebellum is atrophic. It's shrunken. You can see all the, the folds. And in addition, the pons is shrunken because that has the connections of the cerebellum. And there's scarring in the pons. You see this cross here, this white cross? That's called the hot cross bun sign because the pons together with that cross looks like a hot cross bun with the icing being the white part. And um, this is a fairly extreme case. This is another important part of the nervous system that's involved in MSA, the autonomic nervous system. When, I, when we say autonomic, just think automatic, because that's really what it is. 
it's the automatic things that we don't need to think about. So for example, our, our pupils dilating, our tear glands, our saliva, our heart rate, our, the muscles in the, the pipes in our lungs, the bronchi, the movement of the stomach and the rest of the digestive tract, the adrenal gland, uh, the bladder, sex organs, uh, these are all part of the autonomic nervous system. And in MSA, there's problems with, with a lot of these. Not all of them, but a lot of them. The, the, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic simply do opposite things. Constriction, dilatation of the pupil. The uh, parasympathetic stimulates the digestion and the sympathetic inhibits it. Uh, don't worry about all those details. Don't worry about the specific connections here. The point is that in MSA, there's a, a lot of problems with the spinal cord connections of these autonomic reflexes. They're, the cells in the spinal cord actually break down, some of them, and cause all sorts of problems with these organs. So the most important ones in MSA are constipation and bladder control, and in men, erectile function. And uh, those are the important ones. There can also be uh, problems with constriction of the pupils, uh, not enough tears, uh, not enough saliva, uh, heart rate problems, not really. Uh, that's more in Parkinson's disease, but you can also, you can get breathing problems. I don't know why they put the brain here because that's not really part, a relevant part of the autonomic nervous system. Okay, let's move on. Now, so that's kind of the nature of the beast. Now let's talk about the, the duration and the, uh, the age and the uh, the age at which it starts, and how long survival is, and when the important features start to appear. This is a pretty good chart showing that. Here's MSA compared to PSP and Parkinson's disease. As you can see, MSA starts a little earlier than Parkinson's. See, MS, uh, MSA starts on average in the mid-50s. And this whisker coming out of here is uh, that shows you the uh, standard deviation, which means that about a, a third of people are between that point and that point, and another third are between that point and a similar point over there, and the uh, the remaining third are outside of those two standard deviations. Uh, so Parkinson's tends to start a little later in the 50s on average. It's only an average, you see. There's a standard deviation. And PSP starts much later in the early 60s, mid-60s. Now, the width of the bar, the width of the green bar, is the survival. And this is our hurdle as researchers, and it's your hurdle as patients. MSA survival, unfortunately, is not that long on average. See, it goes, uh, it's something like eight years, similar to PSP. Now, with Parkinson's, it's much longer, something like 15 years. But before there was good medication for Parkinson's, uh, it had a similarly short duration of survival, just like MSA and PSP do now. You can see the DX. That means when the diagnosis is made on average. Diagnosis is made only... Uh, a couple of years, uh, you know, maybe three, four, five years into the diagnosis in Parkinson's. But in the case of MSA, it takes the same amount of time, but that's a bigger chunk of the total disease course. So that leads to a lot of unnecessary diagnostic tests, inappropriate treatments, and a lot of stress not knowing what your diagnosis is. Uh, I won't go through these other disease milestones here. The abbreviations are up there, and you can come back and look at this at your leisure. Not that it makes pleasant reading. Now, let's talk about the diagnostic clues, uh, the, um, the combination of cerebellar ataxia, uh, rigidity and bradykinesia, meaning Parkinsonism, and the autonomic. Well, if you see all three of those things, then 
for the doctor, the diagnosis is pretty easy. But we don't always have all those things, or maybe there's some other reason why somebody might have cerebellar ataxia, like maybe they're an alcoholic or something like that. So you have to look for other diagnostic clues. And going through this will also help you all understand the kinds of things that can happen to people with MSA. I don't want you to think that all these things happen to everybody. Far from it. These are, this is just a catalog of things that could happen in the future, things that your doctors have to be aware of so that if you call them up or call her up someday and say, hey, I'm having symptom X and is this part of my MSA, the doctor should know. This will give you a little leg up on them. Uh, so dystonia. This is one of the part of the motor symptoms. Dystonia means a, a uh, continuous in, uh, involuntary inappropriate posture of part of the body. So a forced smile, a uh, strange um, flexion of the hand where fingers are pointing in various directions, uh, where the head is tilted forward so the chin is on the chest, and a sideways bending of the trunk when you're sitting down. This is this, this uncharitable term, the Pisa syndrome, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Then you can have uh, jerkiness to the movement. In fact, even if you're not moving, somebody with MSA can have little jerks in the muscles. They're called myoclonic jerks. And then when you move, the movement is punctuated by uh, superimposed myoclonic jerks. So if you're uh, moving your hands around, instead of being a smooth motion, it'll be kind of a staccato motion. Then you can have speech problems that are out of proportion to the Parkinsonism. With Parkinson's disease, the speech is just soft and a little rapid, but it doesn't have the high-pitched, pinched quality that speech of MSA does. And usually the volume in MSA is lower, and you can have a tremor in the speech, which you don't have in Parkinson's disease. Now, non-motor things. This is a long list. Uh, ventilations. All right, maybe ventilations. In other words, breathing movements. You could consider that to be motor, but uh, it's usually uh, put in the category of non-motor because it has nothing to do with movement of the limbs. Uh, the inhalations can be very harsh and strained sounding. It can really sound kind of frightening to a person's... Um, caregiver, and it sounds kind of like this. I'll try to imitate it. So th it sounds like, sounds like you're dying, but you're not. It's just that there's a obstruction to the flow of air, and it's not even that serious an obstruction. It's just enough to make a noise. There can also be an irregular breathing rhythm with these deep inspirations that are like sighs, and you can have the opposite. You can have periods of apnea, which means periods of not breathing. And this is frightening to the caregiver as well, but not very dangerous because the person will just resume breathing. Rapid eye movement behavioral disorder. This can be very uh, dramatic. There have been uh, movies about this uh, where you act out your dreams. The the uh, connection between the dreaming part of the brain and the moving part of the brain doesn't get turned off like it should be during sleep, and so you, you act out your dreams. And uh, it's very common for there to be violent movements and to actually punch the bed partner or kick them. Uh, and sometimes it gets more complicated than that with sleepwalking and doing complex movements during sleep, and of course that's what they make the movies out of. Uh, the, uh, the treatment I'll talk about the treatment for this later. But this can precede other signs of MSA by many years. Now, this also occurs in Parkinson's disease and in some of the other neurodegenerative diseases. So somebody with rapid eye movement behavioral disorder can have it just on their own without having any neurological disease, or it could be the first sign of Parkinson's. And in a few rare cases, it could be the first sign of MSA many years before any other signs appear. Then there's a problem with the autonomic control of the blood vessels muscles. So you get cold hands and feet. You get, uh, 
you can have a constant purplish blue discoloration of the hands and feet and often of the nose. And you can get Raynaud's phenomenon. And that's where the when the uh, hand is exposed to cold, even for a few seconds, like looking for something in your freezer, the hands go through a series of discoloration of uh, red, white, and blue. Then you can have uh, emotional incontinence, which means uh, laughing or crying when it's not quite appropriate, but just for no reason at all, or sometimes uh, when it's a uh, sentimental TV commercial or, you know, ad for life insurance or something like that. Depression is common in MSA. Difficulties with sleep, independent of the abnormal breathing and the acting out of dreams. Because you get abnormalities of sleep, you can have sleepiness during the day. You can get restless leg syndrome, which is extremely common in the population. Uh, something like 10% of the population has RLS at some point. Uh, but it's also very common in people with Parkinson's and MSA. Hallucinations are rare in MSA, as is dementia, but they can occur. All right, now those are the things that should clue in the doctor or whoever to a possible diagnosis of MSA. Now we'll talk about things that should clue you out. In other words, if these things are present, then start thinking about other diagnoses besides MSA. Onset before age 30. Somebody else in the family who has something similar. MSA virtually never runs in families. That's one of the better things about it. And uh, so if someone looks like they have MSA, but there's other people in the family with it, well, then it's more likely Parkinson's disease or um, who knows, other things. I won't, I won't go through the list. Hallucinations unrelated to medication. That can happen in people with dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, which can sometimes mimic MSA in some respects. Other explanations for neurological symptoms, in other words, if the person has a lot of strokes on their MRI scan, then the doctor should think, well, maybe those are the cause of the, of the problem rather than MSA. Same with trauma in the brain, if there's evidence of trauma on the MRI, or if there's some kind of developmental abnormality in the brain, then it makes it tough to say the person has MSA as the cause of their symptoms. When there's dementia, even in the presence of the other characteristic features of MSA, you have to start thinking, maybe this is not MSA, because dementia is so rare in MSA. Disproportionate difficulty with down gaze, that's one of the hallmarks of PSP. That's what the, the name PSP means, is trouble looking down. And um, if you see that, if you have that, then it's not likely to be MSA. And focal cortical problems, what we mean by that is um, problems relating to thinking or speech such as aphasia where you can't um, you can't think of names of things or you can't understand other people or you can't speak at all because of the language problem. Alien limb means um, involuntary movements of the limb that seem to uh, be counterproductive and difficulty with spatial perception like uh, navigating around your neighborhood, getting dressed, that kind of thing. If you see any of those things, then MSA is not likely to be it. Instead, um, corticobasal degeneration is the likely cause of those things, and corticobasal can otherwise mimic MSA sometimes. Now, we'll get into a little bit into the science here. In fact, very little, as promised. I'm not going to take up a lot of our time with this because I want to spend a lot of time talking about treatment. But these are the beasties in MSA, these glial cytoplasmic inclusions. Now, the glia are brain cells that do not have electrical activity. They've traditionally been thought just to support the electrically active cells, which are called neurons. We now know that the glia probably do play a role in learning and other things, even though they're not electrically active. Still, they do more than just uh, act as, uh, as uh, waiters and janitors for the neurons. Now, the cytoplasm is the fluid in the brain cells other than in the nucleus. Okay, 
So uh, the inclusions are these dark things that are in all these cells. And these were discovered in 1989 in uh, people with MSA. And uh, they found them in people who had been considered to have Shy Drager, in people considered to have striatal nigral and OPCA. And they said, hey, this is all, these three are all the same disease. Let's get rid of all those three names and find a new name. And they picked MSA. Maybe not the best choice, but that's what they picked. And uh, this talks about what proteins aggregate in MSA. I'm not going to get into this in detail. Suffice it to say that MSA is no different from any of the other neurological degenerative disorders in that there is some protein in the brain cells that gloms up. And in the process of glomming up, it causes mischief. And in the case of MSA, the main protein that does that is alpha-synuclein, which is the same protein that does it in Parkinson's disease. But in MSA, there's a second protein, P25-alpha, much less important, much less studied, only recently discovered. MSA may be a prion disease, just like all of the other neurodegenerative diseases may be prion diseases. That means that this abnormally folded protein induces its normal brethren to fold abnormally in the same way. It kind of infects them. And it's, this problem spreads through all the proteins of that kind in the brain cell, and then it goes to other brain cells. And that may be how the disease spreads through the brain. And if we can figure out how this process works in detail, we may be able to figure out a drug that would interrupt some step in that process, and that would prevent MSA or the other neurodegenerative diseases from progressing. That is something devoutly to be wished. Propagation, this just diagrammatically shows what I just was talking about. So how could we stop that process? We could maybe give antibodies against the small stage uh, clusters of the protein in its misfolded state. That's what these oligomers mean, they have small, small clusters. Maybe we could give drugs that could be maybe administered by mouth, unlike antibodies, that maybe could prevent this process. All right, now let's talk, let's get back to the present. All that is uh, for the future. Let's talk about the present. What can we do right now for somebody with MSA? What can you do for yourselves, for that matter? Well, the cardinal features of MSA, the Parkinsonism, would get treated the same way they would get treated if they were part of any other disease. The rigidity and slowness would get treated with carbidopa levodopa, if it's present. If you're in a part of that yellow triangle, that, that uh, MSA triangle, where there's not much rigidity or slowness, then there's no point in taking this medication for rigidity and slowness. You have to be careful because this can aggravate low blood pressure. And that's a big problem with MSA. It's not as much of a problem with Parkinson's disease. The cerebellar ataxia, we don't have drugs for, unfortunately. But there are physical therapy measures for balance, uh, traditional methods of balance training. Tai Chi seems to work. And uh, gait aids, of course, mechanical gait aids, uh, canes, walkers, when necessary. And the tremor caused by the cerebellar problem, it's a very coarse kind of tremor. And sometimes you can dampen it down by putting weights on your wrists, the kind that people use when they work out. The bladder problems will be treated like bladder problems occurring in any other conditions. With these drugs called anticholinergics, they block a chemical called acetylcholine. And the, the drugs that you see advertised on TV, so you, know, you can stay out in the rowboat with your grandchild and don't have to come back on shore and go pee, that's, uh, that's these drugs. Side effects of them are they can cause dry mouth, dry eyes, and constipation. Occasionally, they can leak across the blood-brain barrier 
and cause brain side effects like confusion and sleepiness. But that doesn't usually happen with these drugs. That's why they're called peripherally acting. Then there's a class of drug called alpha adrenergic blockers, or just plain alpha blockers. Flomax would be a common one there. And uh, the problem is they can aggravate low blood pressure as well. In extreme cases of the bladder problems, uh, if there's um, if there's just constant uh, incontinence or maybe retention, then a urostomy might be necessary. A urologist, a neurourologist, hopefully, would be the one to make that decision and to do the procedure. Uh, this is where the um, there's a, a soft tube that goes through the lower abdomen into the bladder and it drains into a bag. Uh, it allows a much better quality of life than constantly than having to wear a, a diaper or to do a straight catheterization every time the bladder gets full. Constipation is treated the same way that it would be in anybody else. So you start with just a stool softener and fiber and hydration because those things don't actually act on the muscles of the colon. Only if those things don't work well do you resort to laxatives, which actually stimulate the muscle of the colon. You want to avoid these because you can get habituated to these, and they will work less well over time. They're best used only on an as-needed basis. Treating the low blood pressure. This is a trick. This is a, a whole subspecialty in itself, pretty much. Uh, you start with making sure that you're not restricting your salt too much because a lot of people think they, that no matter what ails you, limit your salt. Well, if you got MSA, you don't want to limit your salt because uh, that would lower your blood pressure further. Make sure you have enough salt and enough fluid. And people with MSA, because they have bladder problems, they'd often with, uh, withhold fluid from themselves and they, they're, they're dehydrated a lot of the time. I uh, want to avoid that. Very important. If you fail to have enough salt and fluid on board, then these drugs down here aren't going to work very well. Uh, pressure stockings, TED stockings, also helpful. Elevating the head of the bed six inches. But this is I'm not talking about raising the head of the bed like you would put pillows or like a hospital bed would, would raise. I mean putting blocks under the, the legs of the bed so the entire bed is tilted. And if you're feeling lightheaded one day, you know, you wake up in the morning and you just can't shake that feeling of lightheadedness from low blood pressure, drink a full glass of water. Not Gatorade, not anything else, just water. Now the drugs that can be used to raise the blood pressure, these can be tricky because sometimes they can raise it too much, so you have to monitor your blood pressure closely. The doctor really has to be familiar with how these drugs work. Uh, this, this one, pyridostigmine mestinon, is mostly used for people with myasthenia gravis. They don't have low blood pressure, but the drug works for, uh, for them, for their problem as well. A big side effect of these drugs is that they can cause fluid retention. So you can get swelling of the legs. Treating the depression is treated just like for anything else. Uh, you start with some kind of non-drug treatment, hopefully, if there's a professional available to you who's able and willing to do that. But if not, then the standard antidepressants, we don't know which ones work best, if any. The doctors just use whichever ones they feel most comfortable and experienced using. That's perfectly fine. If you ask your doctor, why did you pick that one, don't expect a rational answer. There is no rational reason to prefer one antidepressant over another in people with MSA. And the dementia of MSA, although it's rare, it sometimes occurs and uh, sometimes needs to be treated. These so-called memory drugs like Aricept, Exelon, and others, they can be used in MSA. Occasionally they can aggravate the bladder problem. They can make you want to urinate more frequently. They can also speed up the action of the GI tract, which in MSA would be a good thing. 
sleep disorder. Uh, the most important thing for the insomnia of MSA is sleep hygiene. In other words, make sure your schedule is regular. Don't stay up really late any night. Make sure that even on weekends when you don't have to get up out of bed in the morning, get up anyway, just so that you are on a nice regular schedule. A regimen of exercise helps you sleep better at night. And sleeping pills when necessary. There's no special sleeping pills that are preferable in MSA. Obviously, try to avoid ones that would reduce the blood pressure. Uh, the REM behavioral disorder is treated with this drug clonazepam, which is used widely in psychiatry for mood stabilization. It's used for all sorts of other things in neurology. It seems to be really helpful taken at bedtime to prevent the acting out of dreams. Of course, you have to take it every night because you don't know which night you're going to have that attack. And the obstructive sleep apnea, this is a complicated issue, it can be treated with a CPAP machine, which basically maintains the pressure in the airway all the time so you avoid having the obstruction. And in some cases, it may require a tracheotomy. Uh, if someone has problems when they're awake during the day, it may require tracheotomy with a, a uh, machine helping uh, no, sorry, not with a machine, but just with a uh, mechanical uh, device uh, keeping the airway open. The dystonia that I mentioned before, these odd postures of the hands or other parts of the body, bracing, splinting may help, although usually that turns out to be more uh, uncomfortable than anything. And injection of Botox. A lot of people are surprised to hear that Botox can be used for things other than cosmetic enhancement. Actually, we neurologists were using it for all sorts of hyperkinetic movement disorders like dystonia long before it was used for cosmesis. Uh, myoclonus can be treated with clonazepam or with another drug called Keppra, which is usually used for seizures, which fortunately are not part of MSA. The erectile dysfunction can be treated with the drugs in the class of Viagra, but they can really aggravate low blood pressure. So you'll read in some places that these drugs are contraindicated in people with MSA. Not quite true, but close enough, and they have to be used with a lot of care. And the other uh, treatments of erectile dysfunctions, such as penile injections of a, a drug, um, prostheses uh, that can be inflated, consult a neurourologist. Don't try those things at home, kids. Restless leg syndrome can be treated with Cinemet or other Parkinson medications like these, Mirapex and Requip. And clonazepam also helps. The drugs that are being advertised for RLS are these because they're the ones with the patent that's still in effect. So these are really expensive options because they still have their patent and you can't get them uh, in the long-acting form. You can't get them generically. Cinemet, the patent long ago expired, works at least as well as the expensive ones. And it's a lot cheaper. And clonazepam is also very cheap because it has no patent. For hallucinations, rare in PSP, but these drugs can help. Now, there's a whole raft of drugs that can help hallucinations in other psychiatric conditions, but those can aggravate the movement problem in MSA and should be avoided. These are the only ones that would be safe to use in MSA, except that they can reduce the blood pressure as well, as many other, many other drugs can. So be careful about low blood pressure with these, but very often they can really make the difference between uh, somebody's uh, between being very disabled and being able to lead a behaviorally normal life. And the daytime sleepiness, uh, very often just treating the nighttime insomnia is, um, is a solution, but giving drugs that keep you more awake, like Provigil, New Vigil, they can be helpful. So, uh, experimental drug treatments. Um, this is not a happy list. Uh, most of these things have been shown not to work very well. And in fact, this rifampicin, the result of this study was just announced last week. I didn't have time to put
put it in the uh, in the chart, but it was just announced at the American Academy of Neurology in San Diego that unfortunately it it failed in MSA. Uh, so we are still we're waiting other ideas. All these things work by very different mechanisms. So it's not like they're all just variants of the same thing, and that's why they all failed. Uh, so there may be other disease mechanisms that can be addressed. So let's summarize before we get to the Q&As. Um, MSA affects multiple areas of the brain and spinal cord, like Parkinson's and many other neurodegenerative disorders, but MSA may be more than most. The three principal features, of which you can have one or more, are the Parkinsonism, the cerebellar, and the dysautonomia. And they respectively were called striatonigral, sporadic OPCA, and Scheidrager. But those are now outmoded terms now that we know that they're all the same thing. Important features also may include depression, disordered breathing, mild cognitive difficulties, emotional incontinence, changes in vocal quality, and sleep problems. Under the microscope, you get these glial cytoplasmic inclusions that are composed mostly of alpha-synuclein. And they are in the uh, glial cells, the astrocytes, not in the neurons. And the, um, the problem with MSA may be misfolding of these proteins that then induces the normally folded copies of the protein to similarly misfold, propagating through the pathways of the brain. And that's called a prion, a prion phenomenon. So if the prion phenomenon is true, then this opens up all sorts of new possibilities for ways to stop or at least slow down the progression of MSA. And if we can figure out a way of doing this for something like Alzheimer's disease, where there's a lot of money being devoted because it's such a huge public health problem, whatever works for Alzheimer's may also work for MSA because it may be the same basic, basic process going on that spreads the meanies through the brain. It's just different kinds of meanies, different kinds of proteins. Meanwhile, treatment of MSA is symptomatic. All those drugs and treatments that I told you about just treat the symptoms as isolated symptoms. And that will be all for now. And now I'll be happy to take your questions. I see a question here. Is MSA an autoimmune disease? No, it is not. Uh, there does not seem to be any, uh, well, there's no evidence of that. Uh, although in, in all of the neurodegenerative diseases, there seems to be a, um, an, an immune component, but it's probably just a reaction to the damage. The brain is trying to clear away the damage using the immune system. And that may contribute to the damage, actually, but it is not, at its origin, an autoimmune disease. Next question. Will the hot cross buns always appear in MSA? No, not nearly. Uh, it's, it, it's only in, no, well, maybe less than half of everybody. Uh, it's mainly in the, uh, the OPCA type, the cerebellar type of MSA. Dr. Golby, if I could just jump in for a second. Uh, I apologize. My, uh, my client froze up and crashed, so I had to restart it right at the end of the presentation. Um, so I just want to give people uh, a little bit of instruction here to submit your questions. Um, there should be a white box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, go ahead and type in any questions you have there, and we're going to try and answer them as best we can. Okay? Okay. Well, I've, I've answered two of them already. Uh, now, the third one, uh, regarding 4 to 5% of those with MSA who have dementia, is that a number from autopsy-confirmed research? How can a neurologist differentiate between a rare dementia of MSA and dementia with Lewy bodies? 
Well, the, the answer, th this would be not from autopsy confirmed series, it would be from clinical series. And um, the, uh, the neurologist would be, this would be in a patient who already has MSA, uh, does not look like they have dementia with Lewy bodies, and then they develop dementia. They still don't look like they have dementia with Lewy bodies, they, because dementia with Lewy bodies does not produce cerebellar stuff or dysautonomia very much. And then there's all those other little uh, features of MSA that I mentioned that don't occur in, in DLB. So that's, that's how you would tell. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Has the doctor done one on PSP? Oh, you betcha. You betcha. That's how I spend most of my life is talking about PSP. The next, the next PSP talk will be in Peabody, Massachusetts, which is about a half hour north of Boston on um, April 27th. And we will be recording that for people who didn't uh, sign up for the conference. So you will be able to see it on YouTube uh, once, it, uh, once it's been presented. Uh, I'm disappointed you didn't speak more about PSP. I don't think it's the same as MSA. No, it's not. But it's similar in many, in many cases. The, uh, PSP can look very similar to the Parkinsonian form of MSA. Uh, can I have a copy of your PowerPoint? Yeah, that'll be posted on the uh, Cure PSP website. Are, uh, is I, IVIG helpful? No, because it's not an autoimmune disease. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, is what Lily is working on proteins promising? Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what Lily is working on, but yeah, as I said, trying to keep the proteins, the, the alpha synuclein from misfolding and aggregating is a big part of, of research, of ongoing research in MSA. Uh, what's the role of neuropathy or pins and needles like numbness in the feet and legs in MSA? Uh, there's very little of that in MSA. It can, yeah, it can happen, but I would look for other causes if somebody with MSA developed much neuropathy. Are head tremors and jerkiness of the hands and limbs more cerebellar or Parkinsonian type? They can be either. They don't, uh, they don't particularly uh, segregate with either of those. Uh, is it possible to live 20 years with PSP if careful? Uh, okay, well, you're asked about PSP, not MSA. Yeah, there have been people with PSP who have lived 20 years. Uh, it's rare. What can be done for eyes that are difficult to keep open? That's what Botox is for. Botox injected into the little muscles of the eyelids by a specialist can help you avoid that problem. It's called blepharospasm. can happen in MSA, happens in PSP. It can happen all on its own. What do you think of stem cell treatment? Uh, it's not ready for prime time, but I have high hopes. Uh, is creatine and phosphatidylserine helpful? Um, no, not for MSA. Um, I understand MSA and CBD are different. My dad has CBD. Symptoms are similar. Uh, he's having jaw clenching and teeth grinding. Will Botox help? Um, yeah, they can help, but it, it's, as you say in your last sentence, I've read that it's dangerous because it can make swallowing difficult. Absolutely. Botox injected into the neck area can leak into the swallowing muscles and make swallowing difficult. And if you've already have a disease that makes swallowing difficult, then you can get into big trouble. But yes, uh, jaw closing dystonia can respond to Botox. Uh, biggest problem is speech problems. Yeah, that sometimes happens with MSA, yep. What about stem cell replacement therapy? I mentioned that. I, I don't think the cell replacement therapy is going to happen anytime soon with any neurological diseases. What the stem cells may be useful for is delivering drugs or delivering um, trophic factors that help the brain regrow rather than replacing the cells that have already uh, been lost. I've been diagnosed with MSA autonomic. Others say it's not a type of MSA anymore. Your triangle shows autonomic as a type. Is it less common? Well, actually, what the literature tends to, the way they tend to classify it is just regular MSA is 
mostly autonomic. And then if the person is mostly Parkinsonian or cerebellar, then they subclassify it. But I, I wanted the, the concept that I showed in the triangle is still true. It's not any less common. Okay, I have a friend in the advanced stages. He's only 46. What kinds of things do I need to watch for? Uh, well, the main, the main potential complications, regardless of the person's age, would be um, swallowing difficulty with getting food down the wrong pipe and uh, balance difficulty with falling and hurting yourself. Uh, are there any indicators that will show the speed at which the disease is progressing? Uh, no, there really is not. Uh, you just have to look at how fast it has progressed up to that point. And there is a, a rating scale for MSA that, can, that the doctor can use at each visit that can indicate the, the progression. Did I understand the misfolded proteins are causing healthy proteins to misfold? Yes. So it's a matter of finding out how to stop the misfolding process. Absolutely right. Next, is it relatively common for MSA patients to slowly lose ability to read? Eyes sore yet can still use laptop for communication. Uh, yeah, because reading requires um, a, a very coordinated kind of uh, movement of the eyes where you, you follow along one line without losing track of it, and then you flick down to the beginning of the next line. That's a real trick. You know, uh, we don't think about it, but it, you can lose that very easily when you have MSA or PSP. Is there a centralized place MS patients can go? Uh, for medical care, I assume you mean. Um, well, there are, there are centers around the country where uh, MSA is uh, studied at, in medical schools. What I would suggest you do is call up your nearest medical school and ask if they have a neurologist, ask for the Department of Neurology, and then ask if there's a neurologist who is particularly interested in MSA. And if the answer is no, then call up the second nearest medical school until you find somebody. Um, can you speak about loss of empathy? That's the mild cognitive change in my husband that's troubling me the most. Yeah, there can be a, a loss of, that could be part of the depression, possibly, and, and that might respond to an antidepressant or maybe to psychotherapy. What role does sweating or not play in diagnosing MSA? Um, this, this can establish the presence of dysautonomia, of a loss of autonomic reflexes. So that can help make you suspect MSA, but it's not going to diagnose this all by itself. How do you regulate blood pressure with MSA? Uh, those drugs I mentioned, uh, fludrocortisone, mitodrin, physostigmine, uh, those are the drugs, but before you resort to drugs, then it's hydration and salt. At what point do you bring the patient to the hospital? Uh, well, you bring the patient to the hospital when they are fainting or when they can't walk because the blood pressure is so low that they feel they might faint. In other words, they're disabled. Or if they're just so lightheaded all the time that they can't perform their normal daily activities. Okay, is a handwriting a problem in early MSA? Uh, well, it can be, yes, sometimes. Uh, will stem cell surgery help in a few years? I'm confident in a few years, yes. Did I see they're testing for lithium in depression? Uh, well, lithium is used for mania, which is the opposite of depression. It can be used for bipolar disorder. Uh, is there a special place to go to maybe for a more confirmed diagnosis of MSA? Uh, well, if uh, no Parkinson meds work, does this suggest MSA? Well, if you th think you have Parkinson's and the Parkinson meds don't work, then MSA is a good possibility. Uh, I've already mentioned about where you might go try a medical school movement disorder service. Uh, can I carefully use my tree stand for deer, <laughs> deer hunting? Uh, that's a good question. You know, it depends on uh, your balance. If you have a lot of, lot of balance problem with MSA, then I would say no. And balance problems are uh, tend to be an early and severe problem with MSA. Trying to stay as active as possible, including getting Ohio to sign a bill hoping to open, open up funding from the NIH. Um, all right, well, that's a confounding question. 
I'm glad you're working on lobbying your state legislature to increase research funding. That's an excellent idea. Um, but any kind of activity is good, especially uh, activity that maintains uh, cardio conditioning. Um, let's see, I lost my place here, so let me go back down. Um, is gene therapy a possibility for treatment? I think maybe you answered that one already. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't uh, see one about gene therapy. Uh, right now, gene therapy is not a possibility with MSA because we don't know enough about the genes that cause MSA. Uh, but uh, gene therapy can also be used to deliver proteins that are missing in MSA. Uh, we don't yet know enough about that to uh, to use gene therapy. Okay, I see with, that one. Should a person with PSP limit their salt intake? Uh, and what if they are taking taking BP meds? Uh, th this is a question for um, for your internist, really. In general, someone with MSA has low blood pressure, so they should not limit their salt intake unless there's some other reason to do so, like if they have congestive heart failure or some kind of a kidney problem or an adrenal problem. Uh, my brother was diagnosed with PSP a few years ago at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. He now lives in a hospice home in Wisconsin. He's 53 years old and we now realize many of the things we saw in him uh, were the early stages six to eight years ago already. Uh, this seems to be even be outside of the standard deviation shown on your earlier slide. He has the problem with the downward sight and now uh, swallowing and muscular strength to stand. I guess that was more of a comment than a question. Yeah, uh, this really is not outside of that uh, of those bars here because if he's in a hospice, uh, that means in the, he's in the advanced stages and six to eight years is uh, is within that that range. Um, headaches are they a part of MSA? Well, they, they can be because uh, low blood pressure can cause headaches. My father is 83 and has a nonspecific diagnosis of Parkinson's Plus. Will it change his care plan if we try to figure out a diagnosis? Um, well, not really because you, um, you would treat them all the same, whether it's PSP or MSA or DLB you would treat them symptomatically. Let's go down a little further. Maybe Bruce lost his uh, connection again. Oh, I'm His, intern okay. uh, his internal shaking and a general feeling of anxiety part of MSA. Uh, you can have a tremor in MSA, and anyone who has a tremor can have it internally rather than externally. And anxiety part of MSA, yeah, yeah, you can get various mood disorders as part of MSA. I, I should have mentioned that. It's not just depression. What kind of cognitive issues? Well, de uh, dementia in a few cases. It affects mainly executive function. Yes, that's true. It does affect mainly executive function as opposed to memory or language. Uh, do symptoms gradually come on slowly? Yes. Can someone have a mixture of all three types of the triangle? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, is there any alternative treatments worth trying chelation, glutathione, diet? No, not that we know of. In research, it came that it was helpful, I think. Uh, not that I know of. I uh, have been sitting on commode for hours, cannot fully vacate day after day. Talk to a gastroenterologist. There's usually things that can be done about that. Leg pain that's not able to be diagnosed, part of MSA. Uh, not so much. Well, sometimes... Leg, you can have dystonia, but in the legs and MSA, not so much. More in, that's more part of Parkinson's. Why is speech high and low within minutes? Don't know why. It's just the the control of speech in the brainstem. Are there any current drug trials in the works? Um, yeah, there's there's one, but they're not recruiting at this point. Uh, stem cells I mentioned. Can Botox help feet turning in? Um, Yes, they can, regardless of the cause. Botox can help that. Uh, in research, it came that IVIGs are helpful. Well, that would be a surprise to me. 
does exercise help prolong? Yeah, exercise would be a good idea. You have to be careful, though, because of the balance problem and the low blood pressure. But yes, I would encourage people with MSA to try to exercise. Uh, I've heard that non-responsiveness to Parkinson drugs is a sign of, of MSA, but you mentioned it as treating some MSA symptoms. Can you correct or clarify? Yeah, good question. Um, the Parkinson drugs can help some people with MSA, a minority, and only for a short period of time and only at high dosages. So I, I'll add that refinement there. Thank you. Do you promote no intake of protein at the time close to intake of meds? Uh, no, I don't. Well, for one thing, that's hardly relevant to MSA because the meds don't work well enough for that to be an issue. But even in Parkinson's, that's not really important uh, in many people. Some people it is. Is it true the absolute diagnosis can only be done through autopsy? Yes, that's true. Do symptoms ever plateau for a few years? Uh, not a few years. In Parkinson's, they can plateau for a few years, but not in MSA. I'm on amantadine, which wasn't mentioned. Um, yeah, that's one of the Parkinson drugs that can be used in MSA. I, I kind of mentioned it in, as a generic anti-Parkinson drug uh, line there on one of my slides. But uh, you're right, I didn't specifically mention amantadine. It is useful in some people. I have eye movement coordination issues, did not describe, eyes tracking independently in different speeds. Um, yeah, there is, uh, there is eye movement coordination problems in some people with MSA. That is true. Is work being done on how to communicate long distance? Uh, you mean uh, using technology to communicate? Yeah, uh, talk to a, a speech therapist. They often have devices that can help you do that. CoQ10 in high doses help with CBD. Uh, no, uh, it hasn't been tested in CBD. Uh, it's been tested in Parkinson's and it does not work there. And it's being tested in PSP, don't yet know. What country is more involved in MSA? It's all different countries, not, it's not just the US certainly. Uh, anyway, patient can help, guinea pig. Yeah, keep your eye on clinicaltrials.gov for uh, both treatment trials and observational trials that you can help with. If you don't get a pneumonia, what causes death in PSP? Uh, it would be um, typically uh, some kind of infection, bladder infections, bed sores, that kind of thing. Okay, I am out of time. I have to go uh, start my weekend. <laughs> so I appreciate you all listening. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Golby, for uh, taking the time out of your your afternoon to uh, present this webinar, and also answer all the all the questions that people seem to have. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to the rest of the questions, but uh, we are going to wrap things up. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we did have a great attendance rate, so. Uh, thank you all. Uh, again, we will put a copy of the presentation, uh, a recording of this presentation, as well as a copy of the slides on our website for people to view uh, and study after the fact. So thank you. Uh, everyone have a great weekend.